Good afternoon, everybody. Um, absolute pleasure to be here, and I thank you all for attending. I'm honoured to present on the fundamentals of modern disease. Modern diseases are often called diseases of civilization. We're going to explore what that means. My name is Dr. Pran Yoganathan. I'm a gastroenterologist, which means I subspecialize in diseases of the gut or the digestive tract. The gut is a less formal term for it. The ancient Greek physician um, and one of the fathers of modern medicine, or medicine in general, Hippocrates said, all diseases begin in the gut. I've seen many tens of thousands of patients in my 10-year career as a gastroenterologist and realized with great humility the brilliance of Hippocrates' words. Modern medicine is only now beginning to grasp concepts such as leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And also, we are starting to understand the role of the intestinal microbiome or the gut microbiome in modulating the balance between disease and health. <clears throat> as doctors, we're trained in the management of disease, but not on health, which is the absence of disease. My industry considers disease an inevitability, a fundamental part of life. Conditions such as cancer, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, strokes, autoimmune illnesses are all seeing explosive growth over the last half a century and they've picked up dizzying pace in the last two decades. If disease is an inevitability of life, then why now? It said midlife is when one goes inwards. It was certainly my journey and the second chapter of my life was written. I was in a job that paid very well. I had the respect of my community. Uh, but despite a lot of personal victories, I felt like a, a void had opened up in my soul. I felt I wasn't giving my patients a fundamental solution to their problem. It forced me to look inside, deeper within, and when the veil finally lifted, I was quite humbled. I saw a workforce, my own workforce, which themselves were physically, mentally, and emotionally pushed to the brink. Many within my own industry suffered ill health. And statistics from the Australian Medical Association show that over 60% of my workforce is either overweight or obese. It is said that we are healthcare practitioners, but what we do has very little to do with health and everything to do with disease. Knowing this, I set out on a quest to have some questions answered. I turned within my industry to the logical place to start. I've got many esteemed academics and clinicians within my field. The questions that I had was presented to them. Most of them told me that these rates of diseases were rising simply because of better diagnostic capacity. I was staggered at this response, basically saying that we got better at diagnosing disease and hence the rise. Others blamed their genetic code. They said there was an inevitability weaved into our DNA which meant that we developed disease. Neither of these explanations sat well with me. For disease to rise in such an explosive fashion, there must be more than just genetics at play. Some autoimmune conditions were up 300 to 500% in the last few decades. Worldwide obesity and type 2 diabetes was up 300% in the last two, 20 years. To blame this on genetics or better diagnostic capacity willfully gaslights the population. A more accurate description is epigenetic phenomena. This explains how the environment communicates with our genetic code, shaping and molding it in response to the environment. A more philosophical way to look at epigenetics is to say that if you break nature or break the environment, you witness her melancholy manifest through her children, which is fundamentally us as diseases of modern civilization. A logical place for a gastroenterologist like myself to start when looking at the broken environment is to look at what goes into our gut. What are we putting in our digestive tract? This is our food, or more specifically, nutrition. Nutrition is fundamentally the study of mankind's need for building blocks, essential amino acids, essential fats, vitamins, minerals, and even glucose. Nutrition springs from the earth, or more specifically, from our soil. So my field is quite unique because it is what is grown in the soil that meets the human being within the gut. And food played an enormous role on who we are today. We can never deny that. 
We started off as a very simple primate, sharing a common ancestors with many of the primates that are alive today. But roughly 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens appeared. What had commenced as a very humble journey morphed into a meteoric rise of the most complete and conscious creature that has ever existed on this planet. Nutrition was the fundamental shift that allowed this. If something is so fundamental to us, then how can we willingly ignore it? The answer is we can't. That's the simple answer. We evolved in the cauldron of ancient Earth. We're physically, spiritually, mentally very much attuned to that world, and we seem less at ease from a health perspective with this new world that we have built ourselves. Food comes from the soil, and the people that do this for us are farmers, so it is important that we talk a little bit about farming. For millions of years, we hunted and gathered. Life was extremely difficult. We were at the mercy of the variables, in particular these great migratory animals that uh, roamed Africa. We had to hunt them, we followed them. Because of this, we were nomadic. There was no settled home. It was always changing with the variables. So it's curious when traces of agriculture start appearing on the timeline, roughly 10,000 years ago in Fertile Crescent, in what is now modern-day Iran but also simultaneously across the globe. You see, agriculture was a global movement that spread due to its many advantages. Firstly, it allowed settlements that blossomed into villages and then finally grew into some of these majestic cities of our rich history. Food security increased, and as food security increased, our reproductive rates exploded. Our populations boomed during the agricultural era. From this river flowed this great ocean, and, and, and on top of that ocean sat this raft we call civilization. And the pillars that held up this raft were money, legal code, art, poetry, organized religion, and many more. So for this reason, agriculture is often considered the shining light that illuminated the darkness of being a hunter-gatherer. But in nature, there exists a fine balance. When, when you perturb this, there is always consequences. We're going to have to look at some of those consequences. Firstly, sanitation is one of them. As we settled in villages, we had to exist closer to the digestive waste of us and the domesticated animals that we had. So obviously, infections rose quite rapidly. Even to this day, many places in the less developed parts of the world lose millions of children every year simply from drinking contaminated water. One of the greatest acts of public health should not be attributed to medicine and doctors, but to the engineers that devised the sewage system that carried waste aware, away from where we existed. It saves countless lives even to this day. Agriculture also saw a dramatic shift in our diet. We went from very nutrient animal, animal source foods, very nutrient dense, to a more starch and grain based calorie. So what happened during this era? Well, a few things, and it can be tracked in the fossil records. We shrunk our stature. We got shorter. Our jaws shrunk. Our teeth and dentition worsened, which is a sign of systemic inflammation. Diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis start appearing in the agricultural era, roughly about 6,000 years ago. And what is most surprising to me is our skull capacity shrank. Now you consider that for a moment. If you think the complexity of a brain of a primate is based on its skull size or brain size fundamentally, we became less able in this era, which is interesting. So physically there was a deterioration, but we managed to build great megalithic structures that we see all throughout the world. And this is fundamentally a massive part of this that comes from the fact that we harness the power of the collective rather than the individual, which, um, which sometimes hunter-gatherer societies cannot allow. So despite a lot of these negatives, farming was a net positive for humanity and our growing population reflected this. Ancient man was something we would call a regenerative farmer. What does that mean? Very simply put, it is a focus on regenerating the soil, not taking from the soil all the time, but regenerating the soil and looking after the land, working with the land. 
And for thousands of years, we work like this with farming. But this wasn't going to last forever. Something very dramatic was on the horizon, something terrible for humanity, actually. And it happened at the end of World War II. You see, to solve the problem of feeding the troops, the American government turned to industry to, to, to make, basically make food that could survive unrefrigerated for many months. Industry solved this problem, and it was a success in feeding the troops. But the war ended suddenly, and industry had churned out a lot of this product, and there was no consumer base now. So industry went back to government, given that a lot of them were government subsidised, and said, we need to solve this problem. There will be enormous waste. So they devised a plan, right? And this was to market this to the American homemakers, these foods, as something efficient, healthy, convenient, and even fashionable. That message was woven into TV shows, into sports programming, and to everything else. And food advertising was fundamentally born. From there, it was a race to the bottom, unfortunately. Um, now that the control of the ingredients were out of the hands of us and in these uh, companies, it, you know, they just hired chemical engineers to refine the product till it became hyper palatable and frankly addictive, till Americans were eating 30 to 40% more sugar than they ever had. And this was having health consequences. You know, there was a dramatic rise in heart disease and other diseases. But did they care? No. They, in fact, sought to suppress it. Science for sale. And this is when they paid, or the sugar lobby, paid Harvard scientists. They sponsored Harvard scientists to design a study showing that sugar had no ill effects to health. And this was all published in our most prestigious journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, and there was no disclosure on the sugar sponsorship. But what I find most sinister was as all this was occurring, a decay in the messaging around food started occurring, social engineering. They started demonizing whole foods that human beings had consumed for an eternity, for millions of years. Eggs, butter, unprocessed red meats, such as beef, lamb, mutton, venison, and so forth. Many of the patients that I still see in rooms today believe these foods cause disease simply because we've been programmed that saturated animal fat and animal protein is unhealthy for us, and we minimize them. As a result, there is no doubt our consumption of ultra-processed foods rose quite significantly. Now, how is this relevant to farming? Because that was my initial um, message. We we're going to talk about farming in the soil. You see, in the pursuit of an ultra-processed way of eating, this has to change farming. Diversified farms of old had to give way to a new type of farm, genetically uniform, one type of crop. You know when you drive past the farm now and you see row upon row of the same type of crop? This is normal to us. We live in the era of monoculture farming or monoculture agriculture. These are fields planted with one crop over a huge space, usually corn, wheat, or soy. This doesn't happen in nature. She favors diversity, and diversity helps with pest and weed control. We lost diversity, so huge surges in pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer occurred during this period. Farmers then became reliant on this chemical-based agriculture. Pharmaceutical use also became rampant. A series of studies in the 40s and 50s showed that if you fed animals or livestock antibiotics, they gained weight faster with less feed required. So 80% of the antibiotics produced in America go towards livestock. Only 20% goes towards humans. What does this chemical-based agriculture do to the soil? You know, the soil's microbiome is everything to the plant. It harnesses the microbiome. The plant itself is a farmer harnessing the fungi and the bacteria within the soil. And it regulates its health and nutrition this way. And soil harbors the most diverse and complex microbiome on earth. However, in farms, soils are sadly exposed to the digestive waste of these animals that have had antibiotic exposure and significant agrochemical exposure. 
These pesticides that are commonly used, such as Bayer's glyphosate, are themselves weak antibiotics within the soil. And over time, the diversity of this enormous biobank of the microbiome in the soil degenerates, and we reflect within our gut that change. You see, the soil's microbiome and our microbiome is closely linked. We are closely linked. But it's become fashionable to say, well, we could just take a probiotic to help with this degradation and loss in diversity. There is no evidence that that helps. There is no clinically significant studies that shows this is efficacious. What a mess we've got. We seem to have forgotten that the health of a human being is very much dependent on the soil, the plants, and the animals that feed on Earth. We have to change. It's obvious we have to change. But there is significant resistance to changing. Why? We have a small number of giant multinational corporations that control seed, crop, and food. These giants buy out smaller competition. And this eliminates the free market and the healthy competition that is needed. What does this market concentration mean for farmers and consumers? You see, these dominant companies gain greater power in dictating how these foods are produced. And farmers lose control and have little choice on how to grow crops or raise animals. Many highly concentrated corporations also have a significant presence within government agencies where they use their power to influence policy. So, as with all other trends in industrialization, the use of chemical and pharmaceutical inputs in agriculture offered gains, but not without health and ecological consequence. We traded in a surplus of calories for a decline in the quality of our calories. We moved further away from these ancestral methods of farming, breaking the environment and our gut and our gut is critical in our health, and it has to manifest through us as disease. So to fix mankind's health, it is not a pharmaceutical revolution like the drug companies will tell you, but we're going to have to repair the health of the environment in which our food is grown. My call to action is this. Minimize your personal consumption of hyperpalatable, ultra-processed foods. Understand where your food is coming from. Connect deeply with what is on your plate. Get to know your butchers, your small-scale grocers, and even better, your farmers. Try and throw all your weight and support behind this spark, which is about to become a flame, which is regenerative agriculture, which is farming with soul. It has the potential to reverse this growing tide of disease in us human beings. Thank you.